Welcome back to Thailand. It's a gloomy day as we have a tropical storm approaching, but we'll see if it ever gets here. Uh, but for today, now for something completely different. This video may never see the light of day, so lucky you if you're actually watching it. It means that I was somewhat successful. You've probably seen this kind of uh, device before. It's like an old style piggy bank, but it's digital. You push your coins through the slot and this keeps track of how much money you've got accumulated. So a friend of mine here wants to do this but for Thai currency. And because there, there's no device like this on the market that understands Thai coins. So we're going to try and reverse engineer this and see how it works, see how we can use whatever technology they've got here, uh, modify it, and maybe build an equivalent device and put it on the market. So first thing I need to do is look at the requirements. So what have we got here? We've got the LCD display that shows you how much money you've got. Now, it's also probably run off a small battery in here. So one of the top design requirements is minimal battery consumption. And you would be surprised at how little power some uh, modern microcontrollers use on the order of microamps to get them working. So the processor inside here that's going to read the sensor, do the math, run the display, right? We need one of those small power. We need a small LCD display that probably only needs to run maybe for five seconds or so after you stick a coin in and otherwise it's not going to display anything unless we used an e-ink display which only uses power as it's updating the display but not while it's showing. If you look at things like uh, Kindles and Nooks the early ones had e-ink displays for low power. Then we need some sort of technology that reads the coin that gets stuck in there. I don't know how it works. It could be uh, optically for how long the uh, like a light beam is broken by the coin falling through the slot. It could be the width of the coin as it's pushed through. Uh, and the accuracy thereof. And the problem is here in Thailand, the one and the two baht coins are very, very close to the same diameter, probably less than two millimeters or three millimeters difference. So we have to experiment with that. Then it has two buttons, which act as a manual override. Like maybe if you don't want to push 20 coins through here, you just push one through, unscrew this, put the rest of the coins in and then hit that 20 times. Or if it misread, you can adjust your value through these buttons. So we need a processor with some persistent memory so we can keep our count. We need a battery. We need an LCD display or an e-ink display. We need this sensor for coins and we need two push buttons. That's definitely doable with uh, modern embedded microcontrollers. But let's see how this thing actually works. Sorry for the glare, but I needed to get some light inside here. Obviously, this is the battery compartment. It looks like maybe two AAA cells, which I think is overkill. If we do a much low power system, we could get away with one of those very small CR coin cells. Uh, it has a reset button right here that if you want to empty your piggy bank out and go buy a lot of chocolate, you just push that button and it goes back to zero. Made in China, of course. And then here is the coin sensor. So I'm going to start taking this into pieces and see what we discover. Yes, we've got two AAA batteries, 1.5 volts each in series. That gives us three volts with a tremendous amount of energy. I mean, th this is really, really overkill for this kind of a device if you program it for 
maximum power savings and you only drive the, the screen when the user puts a coin in. So we can uh, cost optimize that. Now let's dive into the next layer. Okay, I've taken the next three screws out and you can see that this is just a battery carrier on this plastic part. There's no intelligence there, nothing else happening. And then there's a small single-sided circuit board with a reset button. So let's see what's going on with that. Okay, I took a sneak peek at the next layer and it's very interesting. This comes off and if we look at the circuit board, there's a capacitor here, a really big one. It's 10 volt, 1000 microfarad cap, which um, kind of acts to stabilize the power coming in from the batteries, although it's very strange that it should need to do that. And the, the microcontroller is sitting here under a blob of hard plastic. And this is a modern ma mass manufacturing process that uh, is the cheapest possible way you could make this board. You don't even have a chip that's soldered to the board. The board is glued down, a little wire bonding takes place, and then they put that blob of plastic on. Now, if we look at some other things going on here, these two pads on the left side match up with these rubber pads here and it has uh, I think a little bit of conductive material on the bottom of that pad which then uh, shorts out the wires here that sends a signal to the controller that that button is pushed or that button is pushed we have a, a physical push button here that comes into the processor that says that button is pushed so we need three three button inputs. The other very interesting thing is there's a little strip down this side and this is the uh, display connector but there's nothing physically there. The cool thing is the LCD display connects via this rubbery plastic um, connector strip. And this is a very cool piece of technology. I don't want to destroy it. But what's happening in here is this is loaded up with a bunch of tiny little conductors that are go from one side of this rubber part to the other side of this rubber part. And it makes a, a connector that's driven by pressure. And all you have to do is make sure your wires on this side connect up with the proper wires on that side and your LCD is lit up. What else can we determine? We can see that the, the coin mechanism is not optical. It's actually done by the diameter of the coin. Oh, kaboom. Well, so much for that. Let's just simulate what will happen. As you push a coin in, this part is pushed farther down the slot here. So it's definitely sensing the diameter of the coin. And that sliding motion lines up with these pads right here. Each of these pads is an input to the processor. This is the, the kind of the, the common connection. And as that uh, piece slides along here, it's gonna make a connection from here to the five and here to the one and here to the 20 and it looks like this is uh, for British currency because it's like one pence 50p two pence although on the box it said it was for US coins that's interesting we also have a series of resistors here our one that's a blank focus our eight our seven and our six I don't know what the functions of those are other than to um, act as current reducing inputs. You know, the, the input comes from here and it goes through the resistor into the processor. So 
you don't have too much of an inrush or an outrush of power. That's interesting. But this is what I expected for sure. I did not expect this kind of uh, the that plastic ribbon connector. Um, I expected that for the buttons. I expected that for the reset. Um, so this is pretty cool. This is that is absolutely cost-driven manufacturing and cost-driven design to get this down to a reasonable end user cost. Now let's take a look at the display. Okay, here's our display and a quick Google search leads me to discover that this connector is called an elastometric connector, elastromeric connector, and it goes by the brand name Zebra. So there are actually conductive traces on the back side of the glass for this display, which then go through the Zebra connector and back to our motherboard. So this is a super cheap uh, manufacturing technique also, because nothing has to be soldered. Everything is just a pressure fit. So now the cool thing is <laughs> if I can put all that back together and then figure out how we can do this with tie coins and a processor that reads several inputs uh, for the coin size, reads three push buttons and can drive an LCD display, then you know we've got our product. Then we just have to optimize the crap out of it for manufacturing. Okay, a quick correction. I went back and got the box for the part that uh, uh, the unit that I just took apart, and it does show it in UK currency. So the this one is specifically designed for UK coinage, and the other one I have is designed for US coinage. So let me just take this one apart, and we'll see what the difference is on the. Uh, spacing of those sensors on the circuit board for the coin size. And the other smart thing they did in their manufacturing is they used exactly the same size screw for every screw in the product. So you have a bunch of the same size, keeps your uh, parts cost down and makes your parts ordering easier and your manufacturing easier. Okay, I took apart the US coin one and I have yet another correction, but this is the kind of thing that happens when you reverse engineer something. With this still in place and not exploded in my face, I can see that when a coin is pushed through that slot, it's going to push this sideways. This metal bar is going to make a connection between something on this side and something on this side. So if we come over here, and look at the boards. It's not like I said from this big pad to one of these pads. It's from this side, which is all common, and then over to here. This may be the nothing is inserted sensor, and that would trigger the processor to put itself to sleep. That that's a good idea. If this goes high for five seconds, then go to sleep. And you can see the difference between uh, let me framing this is the UK one and they they actually uh, labeled their input pins and you can see the spacing this is the US coin one and the spacing is much much different and they're unlabeled but I'm gonna say that's probably a dime a penny five cents 25 cents 50 cents silver dollar something like that uh, increasing in diameter but similar functionality. So for this company, whoever designed and built this, for them to make a tie coin counter, they're going to need a new rev of the circuit board with the spacing properly for tie coins, and they're going to need a new calculation firmware in here that does the math on the different uh, coins that can be inserted. So this is clearly a scalable solution but um, to put the money into the manufacture uh, or, you know, the design and manufacture of a product that might not sell that well in the marketplace, 
it's a risk for them. So I understand that. But we can definitely understand the underlying technology. Now, let's look at the diameter of Thai coins. Okay, this might look like a Star Wars movie intro, but this is actually all the coins in Thailand. I will say that this coin is the most common, the one bot, and it's worth about three cents US. These two smaller coins are called the 50 Satang and the 25 Satang. 50 Satang is half a bot, 25 Satang is a quarter of a bot. So these are worth two cents and one cents each. The only place you get these is at Tesco Lotus, which is the grocery store in here, or at a 7-Eleven because they price their things at 19.75 baht, and so you get a pocket full of these. These ones I put in a coffee cup, never to be seen again. The one bot and the two bot, I don't like to carry around in my pocket because there's just so many of them. So I actually designed and 3D printed these tubes. That's a one bot of 100 coins. This is a two bot of 100 coins. When it fills up, I take them down to my laundry lady and my condo and I exchange it uh, for a 100 baht note or I just pay her with them because she loves the small coins because she's always looking for small coins uh, when people pay their bills. Okay, back again. After the one bot, we have the two bot. Now, you can see it's only very slightly larger, and we're going to measure these in a second. And so the two bot's worth about six cents, and it actually comes in two different flavors. The older ones are silver, but they've moved to a brass colored one, I think, to differentiate it from the one bot because it's in your pocket and you're paying something at the store. It's in your hand. You cannot tell the difference between these two coins. And that could be a problem for us in this project. Next up is a five bot coin. It's worth about 16 cents. And at, at first glance, you might think that it's actually segmented, but it's an optical illusion because those, those uh, cord lines are on the inside of the coin. The outside is round. So that's cool. And the last coin we have is a 10 bot coin, much larger, and it has a brass insert. Uh, and that's worth 32 cents. And you can see they do actually have the Arabic 10, 5, 2, 1, 50, 25 on them. So let's measure these up and see what kind of challenge we're going to get as we try and measure them through our device. Okay, here's what I found. Luckily, we're in good shape. And see if you see a pattern here. 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. Each of these goes up by two millimeters in diameter, except for the two bot coin, which is, by my measurement, 21.7. Not quite 22. If we were measuring from 22, we would fail. So we need to make this a little smaller. The good thing is two millimeters is dead simple for us to detect uh, even uh, at the 1.7 millimeter distance, it should be doable. Now, let me go and see if I can find an official uh, Thai government website that might tell me if my measurements are accurate. Okay, big thanks to the Learn Thai with Mod website. And in Thai, Mod means ant, like the little crawling insect. And that's a nickname for a Thai lady that I know. And we come down here and she explains that the coins, the diameter of the 10 bot is 26, that checks out. The five bot is 24 millimeters. The two bot is 21.75 millimeters. That's what I found, except I, I, was, uh, I didn't have the accuracy down to the one, five one hundredths of a millimeter. The Let's see, the 50 satang is 18 and the 25 satang is 16. So that perfectly matches up with my measurements. And, and check this out, both the 25 and 50 satang coins are mostly used in supermarkets and convenience stores like 7-Eleven. 
just like I said. Oh, you want to hear a Thai joke? When someone asks you where you live, you say, Oh, I live in the condo next to the massage shop and the 7-Eleven. Because that describes every street corner in Thailand. Anyway, back to our measurement. Okay, so now that we have our measurements, all I would need to do is design a circuit board with this similar uh, footprint and screw holes and with the proper spacing to just trigger for all our different coin types. We have one, two, three, four, five, we have six different coin types. So I just need a, a common part, a go to sleep part, and then uh, one, two, three, four, five, six inputs that the processor can read. And as the coin sliding in, we're going to get readings starting to come in from the sleep to the next one to the next one. And we want to see which is the last sensor that gets hit because that's our true coin size. We can ignore all the other ones. And then when it goes back to sleep, then we know we've, we've got our coin size by the last sensor that was triggered. Now, short of doing that, which is definitely possible, I can send this off to China. I get it back in, uh, you know, three days and it costs $2 for, for 20 of these boards. But using something like an Arduino uh, Due or an Arduino Uno, let me just pull one of them out. So here's an Arduino Due, a tiny little microcontroller, and you can see all of these input and output pins. So what I can do is write a program that pretends that we're running inside here. Then I can uh, assign inputs for each coin size on these pins, which are read by the processor. As soon as I uh, go from ground to one of the inputs, the my software will think a coin has been inserted, but I'm just doing it from a testing standpoint. Uh, so I can completely prove this whole concept out using this board and some wires. And, you know, we can see that for production, we would need to move to this kind of a, a circuit board, a module. There's a guy I follow, EEV blog, Dave in Australia. He has um, found a microprocessor, microcontroller available in China that costs something like four cents, if I'm remembering correctly. And it, it does amazing things for four cents. Um, you know, so what I'm really bound by is the number of inputs and also driving an LCD screen. And Funny thing, yesterday I watched a video from Dave and he's looking for a low-cost, battery-powered microcontroller that can drive an LCD display. So I'm going to stand on his shoulders and see what kind of cool technology he can find. In the meantime, I'm going to build up a, a fake coin machine just with this board. It'll probably take a couple of hours to write the software and test it out. And uh, we'll see if we want to go any further on this project, but it definitely looks doable.